What I'll be talking to you today essentially is the theory and practice in Ottoman fiscal uh, administration. And I'd like to start by saying that that the Ottoman Empire was an Islamic polity did not limit its sources of legal, political, or fiscal organization in the realm of religion, as was the case even in the early history of state formation in Islam. Focusing on Ottoman fiscal administration, this paper examines the interplay between religious and secular dynamics that shape the economic, social, and intellectual context within which the compilation of fiscal records and the practices of revenue raising developed over time. It argues that these transformations were the result of dynamic long doer processes within the Ottoman world, not merely the result of external impeti. <coughs> that foundational principles of Ottoman political thought, such as the circle of justice, uh, one of the things that I'll be talking to you today, persisted well into the 19th century does not signify the perseverance of tradition in the face of modernity, but rather the dynamic evolution of older concepts adapting to, uh, to um, older concepts to form a more predictable and standardized legal and fiscal order, adapting to the fiscal, economic, and financial requirements of a changing global order. Ottoman modernization has been the subject of extended and intense scholarly debate for more than a century. Earlier views grounded on the theocratic nature of the Ottoman state saw change as a result of external, namely Western influences, mainly from the 19th century onwards. That they saw modernization, Westernization, and secularization as synonyms is perhaps the least of the problems of this approach, or perhaps symptomatic of deeper issues, namely that they saw little external capacity for change within Ottoman and or Islamic legal, fiscal, economic, or social structures. This paper focuses on Ottoman fiscal prices, uh, practices to trace their evolution at three key junctures when um, the, uh, their consolidation in the 15th century, the second half of the 17th century, when they underwent through a significant transformation, and their decisive shift towards private property in the first half of the 19th century. And I think there are several overlaps in this periodization with the issues that uh, Idris was discussing earlier today. Linda Darling, uh, one of the most prominent uh, Ottoman historians of our times, has recently questioned the methodological predilection of studying the socio-economic transformations of the Ottoman world through the intellectual treatises of men of letters. Rather than taking at face value the impressions recorded from Istanbul ivory towers, she proposed the close examination of these processes on the ground. Rudimentary though this observation may seem, it goes against the grain of decades-long historiography. More importantly, it comes from one of the most diligent students of Ottoman political thought. How, how can one study the nuts and bolts of Ottoman fiscal and legal organization without limiting themselves to the abstractions of the privileged few who had the luxury to read about, ponder, write, and publish uh, about some I such issues? The benefit of such a perspective from below is an understanding of the evolution of institutions, and with reference to the present conference, the role of the religious therein in a more dynamic and dialectical fashion. A key notion underlying these processes was the circle of justice, an early Islamic concept and one of the foundations of Ottoman political thought, albeit never officially sanctioned as such. Falsely, uh, falsely attributed to Aristotle, the circle of justice is not a top-down piece of political theory that described an, an, an idealized uh, order, but a, a dynamic and almost dialectical in its conception. And I quote, justice leads to rightness of the world. The world is a garden. Its walls are the state. The state is ordered by the Sharia. The Sharia is not guarded except by the king. The king cannot rule except through an army. The army is summoned only by wealth. Wealth is accumulated by the subjects. 
the subjects are made servants of the ruler by justice, end of quote. In its uh, earlier conceptualizations, and there are, of course, various precedents in uh, non-Ottoman uh, Islamic uh, thought as well, uh, what we see here in this 16th century formulation by Kunalizade, it emphasizes the duty of the ruler to provide justice as a prerequisite for the efficient and effective government and fulfillment of the role of the state alongside ethical and religious principles. The notion of justice, adalet, central in Ottoman and Islamic political and legal thought, has often been thought of as traditional and pre-modern. This is certainly true, but it is not exclusively so. Neither an Ottoman, let alone an Islamic prerogative. In the Ottoman case, it has often been thought of as, um, as traditional and pre-modern. Yet justice is an elusive concept that is rarely, if ever, defined by Ottoman intellectuals. The clearest definition, for example, comes from, uh, again, Kunali Zadeh who argues that justice is the maintenance of social order. On the other hand, the opposite of justice is oppression. E <clears throat> equally difficult to define, but crucial in legitimizing popular resistance. Let us also not forget that oppression is what can legitimize jihad against another Muslim state, most famously evident in the case of the Ottomans against Safavid Iran or Mamluk Egypt. Yet, the circle of justice entails a kernel of empowerment for the subjects. It is they who provide the wealth upon which the prosperity of the state and the sovereign is contingent. Put briefly, justice is the foundation of the legitimacy of the ruler. While it would go too far to argue that this constituted a social contract, appealing to the notion of justice and challenging the sultan to make good his claims was a widespread tactic employed by the subjects in their communication with the ruler through the institution of petitions. There is nothing new in these observations. A few decades ago, Boac Ergene made this precise argument. If justice is the cornerstone of, of good governance and the absence of, uh, thereof is oppression, then the de facto outcome is the collapse of social order revolts, rebellions, or disturbances were possible manifestations of this. Another was peasant flight. Warning against this possibility was a common occurrence in the context of petitions in the Ottoman world. More potent was the realization of this possibility. The mass emigration of taxpayers not only had a negative effect on provincial revenues, but in the economy at large particularly so in the case of labor-intensive agricultural economies prevalent in the Ottoman world, this entailed the depletion of available hands, thereby negatively affecting the local economies at large. Peasant flight in the, in the provinces had therefore been recorded to have been noticed by Istanbul, while communicated with, which communicated with local authorities uh, that received subjects from nearby regions. Local authorities were in turn instructed by Istanbul to inform internal migrants that incentives in the form of tax breaks would be offered in case they returned. While this was indeed the, occur the outcome, the same phenomenon was repeated a few years later. That this was a recurring occurrence indicates that the act of peasant flight constituted a non-verbal means to communicate with Istanbul, among other things, the lack of justice. In short, justice was a notion that was employed by Ottoman subjects as a negotiating tool in their relationship with the state. More importantly, the inclusion of this notion in the political lexicon was not limited to those formerly under Ottoman sovereignty. It also included Ottoman subjects that had rejected submission to the Sultan and fought for or acquired their independence in the context of a modern nation state. The Greek case is indicative of this tendency, representing a transitionary stage, not limited 
to the emancipatory language of the Enlightenment and modern democratic concepts, the mental universe of both revolutionary Greece, as well as the period several decades after the foundation of the Greek state, included many an Ottoman political notion. These were not remnants of an obsolete past. They constituted the reconceptualization and reemployment of existing political legal notions to express the challenges of the modern world. If this, was, if this were true of the former Ottoman subjects, Greeks, could it not have been true for others, Muslim or non-Muslim? How were these developments reflected in Ottoman fiscal records? How did justice translate to with reference to the tax obligations of Ottoman subjects? An important caveat uh, is in order. Once more, theory and practice did not necessarily converge, regardless of the period at hand, if in different ways across time. Ottoman fiscal administration stretches back to the 14th century, demonstrating Ilhanid, Seljuk, and Byzantine influences, some of which were streamlined to fit Islamic norms. By fiscal surveys, I am referring here to the registers known as Tahrir, the most comprehensive of which were detailed surveys, Mufassal in Ottoman. An early form of an Ottoman fiscal survey, as well as other indications, demonstrate a degree of experimentation and differentiation in the organization and the information recorded before they were consolidated in a more standardized form by the 1430s. What did these surveys look like? Organized by settlement in their administrative hierarchy, they record the names of all taxable individuals, male heads of households, and lower rate taxpayers, such as bachelors, widows, disabled, etc. As these were fiscal units, there is no information on the composition of the household, if there is one, in the demographic sense of the word. That this precluded comprehensive population data illustrates the strict fiscal character of these surveys. Following the enumeration of all taxable in individuals, listed is the taxable population production and other monetary taxes, fines, and use for the whole settlement. There is no differentiation of taxpayers on the basis of wealth. This reflects an idealized Ottoman social formation or organization. We find two broad categories here in this Ottoman idealized social structure. The tax-paying reaya, meaning flock, and the tax-exempt askeri, which comprised of the military and civil personnel. This, however, contravenes the Sharia. The latter stipulates that the fair distribution of the tax burden requires the allocation of taxation according to three categories of wealth high, medium, and low. That the Ottomans opted to implement their own political fiscal system against the Sharia should raise no eyebrows. This is but one example of how Islamic law was not strictly imp implemented in the face of another tradition or state policy that did not fully comply with Islamic law. It is important at this point to discuss the degree to which the Ottoman state was Islamic. The legal pluralism that characterized the early modern Ottoman world meant that crucial were also secular and customary principles with great sensitivity to local and regional idiosyncrasies, leading many scholars to emphasize Ottoman pragmatism, albeit with a degree of exaggeration. Of course, this is not just Ottoman pragmatism, it is also Islamic, as well as the realities of imperial governance, which we can find in other settings as well. For example, Ottoman sources of revenue included categories of taxes prescribed by the Sharia, as well as customary or secular ones sanctioned by Sultanic law, kanun, the implication being that they could be outside of what Islam stipulates. On a different level, that Islamic law does not officially recognize collective entities did not prevent jurisprudence from devising legal fictions 
that allowed the functioning of structures of representation for the purposes of fiscal and administrative functions somewhere between the de facto and the de jure. This is a topic I cannot expand on at the moment, but would be happy to do so during the Q&A. From a bird's eye view, scholarship has extensively discussed the tensions between Islamic and Sultanic legal codes with diverging opinions on the degree of the fluctuations of the weight and significance that the one over the other occupied at different points in time during the half millennium of the empire's lifespan. To return to the issue of fiscal administration, however, one development of significance was the implementation of tax farming. This was a gradual process, the origins of which can be dated back to the 15th century. In addition, Islamic legal tradition provided solid foundations and a long history of experience with such systems. The implication here was the move towards in-cash tax collection, responding to the challenges of both a monetizing economy as well as the rise of the fiscal military state. Tax farming, while not necessarily beneficial in the long term, carried the advantage of quick and efficient delivery of revenue to the treasury. From the 17th century onwards, there, are, there were no new sources of wealth as there were no expansion, territorially speaking. At the same time, military expenditure were, was rampant on account of the rapid growth of standing armies and the cost of warfare. When the Ottoman state reached its territorial limits by the 16th century, it was stretching from Poland to the Red Sea, from the Maghrib to parts of Iran, and from the Adriatic to the Indian Ocean. The bureaucratic burden of administrating such diverse geographies was, running exponent, was rising exponentially despite the subsequent loss of territories, and monitoring local conditions was costly and complicated, as was close central control. Here is where the parallel and directly connected to tax farming discussion on lump sum taxation becomes relevant. Lump sum taxation entailed the gradual abandonment of fiscal surveys, the, one I discussed, the ones I discussed earlier, which, as we saw, were largely based on the assessment of taxable production. <clears throat> that accuracy in the recording of absolute figures was becoming less and less a priority indicates not the corruption of the classical Ottoman system, as historians have traditionally argued, it involved the rough estimate of one crop in relation to another, to another similar one, for example, wheat and barley. Essentially, it was a more resource efficient method of assessment, albeit one was that less accurate. What had changed here was not the object of taxation, that is production, but the method of assessment. By 1670, another key moment in Ottoman fiscal recording requires attention. The surveying of not only production, but also land holdings. This is observed in Crete on the occasion of the completion of the island's conquest after a two decade long war with Venice, as well as in some of the islands of the Aegean. If this was a pilot project, it was not subsequently implemented. Surveys based on the original system appear well into the 18th century. What is important of the 1670 moment, however, is the experimentation with recording landed property. This was a shift which, as we will later see, reappeared in different shapes and forms. The proliferation of extraordinary monetary taxes, which in time became regularized and constituted an important source of revenue, was also a key development that pushed towards lump sum taxation. As a result, fiscal service became unnecessary in time uh, and were abandoned by the 18th century. The new fiscal regime of lump sum assessment entailed a chain reaction effect at the level of society. This is the most visible, this is most visible in a well-known event in Ottoman fiscal history. In 1691, the chief jurisprudent in Istanbul decreed that the collection of the non-Muslim jizya tax that we heard uh, of uh, earlier, the uh, in return for uh, protection and in exchange of military uh, service, um, which had hitherto 
sorry, uh, would henceforth be assessed on the basis of the Sharia sanctioned three tiers of high, middle, low categories of taxpayers according to their wealth. While it is not explicitly clear why this change concerned non-Muslim taxation, one may speculate a higher degree of sensitivity, one may speculate a higher degree of sensitivity on the fiscal administration of unbelievers, and this is important for three reasons. Firstly, it acknowledged that one of the most important fiscal functions of an Islamic state had hitherto been implemented in an unorthodox fashion by the Ottomans. Aligning sultanic, that is secular, uh, law with Islamic law was a process initiated in the 16th century, but it did not always necessitate, it, necessitate the submission of the former to the latter. It was rather a two-way process, whereby oftentimes an ideological religious veneer facilitated and legitimized fiscal, as in this case, or indeed market-related economic functions, like the way Islamic sensitivities on usury were, were bypassed by a famous chief jurisprudent to permit interest for money lending institutions. Secondly, and to return to the topic of the implementation of the canonical three-tier system, this was initially interpreted by historians as a move towards Islamization. Going beyond the ostensible ideological interpretation, this shift is better understood as a development as connected to and facilitating lump sum taxation, which had by then proliferated. Veiled as a return to canonical orthodoxy, the 1691 reform in fact delegated the function of allocating taxes along these three tiers to the community itself. That the ideological justification behind this change carried less, if any, weight in the actual implementation of the reform is indicative by the fact that on the morrow of its promulgation, it essentially became a dead letter as far as its religious rationale was concerned. On the island of Patmos, for example, taxes were distributed along seven instead of the canonical three tiers violating the Sharia in the, in the contrary fashion. What this implies is that the distribution of the tax burden did not take place in a single standardized empire-wide fashion, let alone any religiously sanctioned ideas of justice, but according to local communal politics and internal balances of power based on social hierarchies. Again, something that got me legitimized through the means of custom. This leads to the third reason why this was an important change. Rather than dispatching officials who would assess and distribute taxes, it delegated, um, it delegated the apportionment of taxation to local communities rather than maintaining a close and costly central control of how the fiscal burden was distributed among the community. This was in turn brought, this got in turn brought long-term and deep socioeconomic transformations within local communities, creating new hierarchies and collective actors. The eventual impact of this phenomenon would be felt well into the 19th century, as it was closely connected to the development of nationalist politics. It would be no exaggeration to state that this was a shift of tectonic character. Not by chance was the birth of this jurisprudential fiscal shift in the latter parts of the 17th century coincided with a key moment in the Ottoman transition to capitalism. And let me move on to the final section of this presentation, discussing private property and how it was not absolutely protected in the Ottoman world for, for most of the Ottoman Empire's existence. A rich corpus of works has debated the nature and limitations of property holding over secular decades. The current consensus argues that there were various degrees of de facto property holdings that were akin to but not in absolute form, private property. This entailed, for example, the right to sell, transfer, or inherit state lands granted to someone. These rights had evolved over time and were not simply introduced in the 19th century, as it was often assumed, as a result of a more intensive incorporation of the Ottoman Empire in a global capitalist economic system. The legal grounds utilized for the development of property rights in the Ottoman world were A, the result of a historically specific process in the 17th and 18th century, and B, were inherent in the Sharia, 
and le where less the ideological consolidation of Islamic law and more the standardization it offered as being more systematically codified as compared to, to sultanic law. Moreover, the room for interpretation it offered, yet within Islamic legal boundaries, allowed local justice, judges to adapt to the greatly varying conditions across a vast geographical extent and local customary pra practices in the empire. These legal developments were reflected in fiscal record keeping as well. We have seen earlier how the first experiments in recording the property of individual taxpayers appeared in the late 17th century, concurrent with other crucial shifts in fiscal organization. Recently discovered surveys from the 1760s and 1770s in particular regions of the empire indicate other experimental modes of recording fiscal data. While appearing to be an ad, of an ad hoc nature, what makes this survey stand out is that recordings are not collective, as in the earlier system, but individual. In other words, they most probably represent yet another transitional stage in this genealogy of Ottoman fiscal records, and one that historians still know little about. Yet another transitional stage towards a property holding oriented record keeping instead of the earlier production oriented one comes in 1833. Another ad hoc development uh, and one that appears to have been a one-off experiment concerns a land and property survey for the island of Cyprus recording the value of lands, uh, trees, buildings and animals. This is a much misunderstood source, a discussion that again cannot afford to enter for the benefit of time. What is important, however, is that it appears to have been a pilot project for the subsequent surveys known as income surveys. The full title was Property, Lands, Animals and Income Surveys, and which from the 1840s became the standard across the empire. The difference between the two is that the latter is fiscal whereby taxation is evaluated on the basis of these properties. In the former, no taxation is mentioned. Both, however, manifest the complete shift in the Ottoman fiscal mind, whereby taxable was not production, but property, in line with the spirit of the times codified in the 1858 Ottoman land law. Interestingly, Corina pointed out that these developments are in fact rather early compared to the European experience. To conclude, this essay has attempted to reevaluate the relationship between religion, law, and fiscal practices and record keeping in the Ottoman world. It has done so focusing more on the practice of, rather than the legal theory behind, the development of Ottoman taxation over a period of four centuries. It has demonstrated how this was not solely Islamic, particularly so in the early centuries of the Ottoman imperial endeavor. It was the result of a dialectic between the Sharia, Sultanic law, and customary practices particular to specific regions of the Ottoman world. The historical outcome of these developments were A, the consolidation of private property, and B, the predominance of Islamic law, particularly with reference to the latter, however, while this may be seen as an Islamization of the empire, such a conclusion would be misleading. It constituted a response to the challenges of early modern state building and the rise of the fiscal military state in, part in particular in tandem with the proliferation of capitalism as a global economic system. That Islam provided the legal tools for this transformation is not to mean that the Ottoman Empire remained a pre-modern or traditional one at a time when modernity was accelerating. Thank you very much.